I'm going to commence our service by turning to the first version of Psalm 100. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with mirth, his praise forth tell. Come ye before him and rejoice. The first version of Psalm 100 and we'll stand as we sing. bow together in prayer. Lord, we thank thee today that we come before the living and true God, one who knows us, one who understands us, one who cares for us. We thank thee, O God, that as we bow in thy presence, thou art looking upon us. And Lord, we thank you that thou hast an interest in all of thy children. Thou hast an interest in the works of thy hands. And we praise thee, Lord, that thou hast promised that where two or three are gathered together in thy name, there thou art in the midst of them. We pray, O God, that we might be made conscious that God is here, that we might receive an outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon us. O Lord, that the Spirit of God might take the things of Christ and that he might reveal them to us, that he might glorify the Son of God. We ask, O Lord, for the hand of God for good to, to be upon every individual that is found in thy house. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we have much reason to be grateful to thee. We thank thee for health and strength, for soundness in a measure in mind and body. Thank you, O God, for food and clothing, for our homes and our loved ones, for our family circles. We thank thee for thy grace that is extended. Lord, we thank you for the work of Christ. We bless thee that he came. We know, Lord, that he came voluntarily. We thank you that he came in order to deal with a problem, a problem that was insoluble as far as we were concerned, a problem that no angel could solve. Thank you that he came to deal with the problem of sin. We bless thee, O God, that he lived a spotless life. We thank you for his mighty miracles, authenticating his deity. Thank you for the gracious words that he spoke. And we thank you for his death on the cross, his willingness to die, his willingness to suffer, 
to be, in a sense, rejected and cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Thank you, Lord, that he poured out his life. He gave his life a ransom for many. And we thank you for his triumphant resurrection. We bless thee that he is alive and alive forevermore. And we thank you that one day, in great triumph, he will return to this world. And so, Lord, as we bow before thee, we acknowledge our total indebtedness to the Lord Jesus Christ. We would not be here uh, without him. We are here because of him. We're here because of his love and because of his work. And Lord, we ask thee to uh, bless each one and to remember this district and this congregation, to remember thy servant, to restore him speedily to health and strength. We pray, O oh God, that uh, thou wilt remember this province, this island, this nation, and that thou, Lord, wilt bless across the face of the earth, that the fear of God uh, might be seen at work, and that men and women who erstwhile have been careless and have not thought of their soul uh, might come to repentance and to faith in the one that we love. We ask, O oh God, for those in authority over us, for our king, for our royal family. We pray, our Father, for thy hand upon our parliament, that they might be checked, O oh God, that when they step forward to make laws and pass laws that are wrong and are wrong in thy sight, that they might be held in check, that there might be that restraining hand upon them. We ask, Lord, for uh, all those in authority, uh, magistrates and, and others who have authority over us, that we might be subject to them in all things except those that contradict thy holy truth. We ask, Lord, for those who defend us, for those who tend to us when we're ill. We pray thy blessing upon them and that many of them might taste of the sweetness of the gospel of Christ. Close us in with thyself. Shut out the distractions that have kept us away from thee for so many times. Lord, shut us in. Speak to our hearts. Help us to worship. Help us to praise and adore. We pray these things in Jesus, our Saviour's name. Amen. We're turning now to the hymn number one, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the Ancient of Days, Almighty, Victorious, Thy great name we praise. We'll stand again as we sing hymn number one,
We're going to read from Exodus chapter 31, and we're going to commence at the first verse, and then we're going to read just two verses from Exodus chapter 39. So Exodus chapter 31 to begin with, a few verses from that chapter, and then we'll be turning uh, to Exodus chapter 39 and reading just the last two verses of the chapter. Exodus chapter 31 and reading from the opening verse of the chapter. Shouldn't have any difficulty finding Exodus, just uh, the second book of the Bible, as I'm sure you're well aware. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezaliel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him Aholiah, the son of Ahizamach of the tribe of Dan. And, uh, and in uh, the hearts of all that are wise, hearted, uh, I have put wisdom, uh, and they may, that they may make uh, all that I have commanded thee. And then we're turning over to chapter 39 of Exodus and just reading the last two verses of the chapter. Exodus chapter 39 and reading verses 42 and 43. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel made all the work. And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. We'll end our reading there. It's a very short set of readings. Ending our reading there at the end of that 39th chapter of the book of Exodus. Going to have the announcements for the week ahead. And I think it's our brother, Mr. Bell, that's going to make them. Uh, I rather confused things this morning. I didn't know I was supposed to take the Bible class, uh, and uh, I didn't turn up for it. I arrived for the prayer meeting and the Bible class was almost over. So our brother had short notice uh, of speaking uh, at the Bible class. So he's going to come and make the announcements for us, please. Well, can we welcome you all to the service this morning? We're glad to see you in your place and you're most welcome. We extend a special warm Word of welcome to the Reverend Gordon Ferguson this morning. We're very welcome, Reverend Ferguson. We appreciate you helping us at this time, and uh, we're looking forward to what you have to say to us throughout the day. The services uh, for the week begin with the Gospel service this evening at 7 p.m., preceded by the time of prayer at 6.30. The other services and meetings of the week, Wednesday uh, is the prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m., And in the will of the Lord, the Reverend Ferguson will be with us. There'll be no youth fellowship this uh, Friday as the Easter convention meetings will be taking place over the the weekend, the Easter weekend. Services next Lord's Day and as well will be the Sabbath school and Bible class at 10.45, morning worship at 12 noon, preceded by the time of prayer at half past 11 in the church hall. And then the evening gospel service at 7 p.m. preceded by the prayer meeting at 6.30. And in the will of the Lord, the Reverend Ferguson will be with us. This Sunday is the Missionary Council offering and the maintenance fund from last week uh, raised £105 of which we give uh, you thanks for your generosity in this matter. There are some additional reminders just to keep uh, these things fresh in your mind so bear with me there's uh, quite a list of them. First of all the Easter Convention services uh, this weekend coming begin on Friday the 7th of April at 8pm. They then continue, that's the, the, youth, the youth evening, then they continue on Saturday the 8th of April at half past seven, so eight o'clock on Friday, half past seven on Saturday, and that's the missionary uh, rally. And then on Monday the 10th of April at 7 p.m. And of course, Friday night is the youth night, and Saturday, as I already mentioned, is the missionary evening. So if you can be at any or all of those meetings, you'll be made most welcome, I would know. Just a little bit of advance notice, the Gospel Bus Planning Meeting 
will be taking place at half past seven on Thursday, the 27th of April. I know that's some time off, but just so that people, uh, that those people who are affected by that are aware of that. And of course, uh, all the workers would be expected to be in attendance. So that's Thursday, the 27th of April at the uh, 7.30. And the Gospel Bus meetings commence on Tuesday, the 2nd of May, the first Tuesday in May. And of course, we covered the prayers of God's people for these meetings as they commence with the boys and girls once again. Do remember the gospel mission plan for the, for the uh, uh, end of uh, the August period, beginning of September, Sunday the 10th to Sunday the 24th of September, preceded by a time of prayer, a week of prayer before that in the church hall. Do continue to pray for that and do continue to pray upon those that you could invite into that mission, uh, that they would hear the words of life. There's uh, invitation cards in the porch as you leave. Please take one to a special anniversary service for the 50th anniversary of Let the Bible Speak. The Let the Bible Speak radio ministry is 50 years old this year. So there's a special anniversary service planned in Balamoney Free Presbyterian Church on Friday the 14th of April at 8 p.m. And there are invitation cards there. Please take one. Um, and again, uh, your attendance there would be encouraged. And of course, you'll be made most welcome. And also, uh, Let the Bible Speak uh, magazine is also in the porch as you leave. Take your copy and take a copy of, uh, for someone that you know cannot any longer get out here with us or someone who you think would have benefit for, from the material contained within it. Please continue to remember in your prayers our own minister, the Reverend Henderson, that the Lord will refresh and strengthen him at this time. And of course, anyone seeking pastoral support uh, during the course of the week should contact one of the elders in the first instance. And do continue to pray for the sick, those who cannot get out um, because of various circumstances and the bereaved of recent days and in past days that the Lord will be that source of comfort to them. And of course, all of these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. Thank you. Do you thank our brother for the welcome here to Money Slain. Nice to be with you. And I'll be helping out for the next uh, couple of weeks still. And uh, as our brother has said, if uh, you need visitation, uh, then contact the elders and they will get in touch with me and I'll be happy uh, to carry out uh, any visitation that is required. Uh, we're, now I better check this. Do you take up an offering? You do, right. So we'll keep our seats for the next hymn. It's number 100. And 82, break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the bread beside the sea. Beyond the sacred page I seek thee, Lord, my spirit pants for thee, O living word. 182, keeping our seats while the offering is being received. Thank you. 
we'll stand for the final verse of the hymn. We'll unite our hearts briefly before we turn to the Scriptures. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that thy blessing will be upon us as we meditate upon thy word. Grant to us the help. Grant to us the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We realize, our Father, that our words will fall to the ground except thou dost bless them, except the Spirit of God take them and apply them to hearts and lives. And so, Lord, we commit our ways to thee and pray that thy hand will be upon us now in a very real and in a very definite way. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to think about a man called Bezaliel, a man filled with the Holy Spirit. In verse 3 of Exodus chapter 31, the Lord says, I have filled him with the Spirit of God. The name Bezaliel means in the shadow of God or in or under the protection of God. He came from the tribe of Judah. His grandfather is Hur. And uh, uh, you may remember that name. It's believed he's the same Hur uh, that held up the hands of Moses when the Israelites were in conflict with the Amalekites. Uh, That was a difficult time. The Amalekites were most vicious and cowardly because they attacked the rear of Israel, where the weakest, where the weakest were found. And uh, Moses, when he held up his arms in prayer, uh, he uh, saw the battle uh, turning for the Israelites. But when he became tired and his arms fell down, the battle went in favor of the Amalekites. Aaron and her uh, held up the hands of Moses while he prayed. And finally, a great victory was achieved over the Amalekites. Here is his grandson, and God says, I have filled him with the Spirit of God. I think that's the most interesting thing about this man. You'll read of the various works in which he was engaged, but the most interesting thing, the most wonderful thing about him is this, God filled him with his Spirit. And that is very important to you and me. If you're saved, you're indwelt by the Spirit of God, But you want something more. You want to be filled with the Spirit of God. And so I want to look at Bezaliel in the light of that statement that he was filled with the Spirit of God in our service today. And the first thing that I want to think about this man is he was required to do a specific work. We are told in verses 4 and 5 what he was required to do, and I could even include verse 6 in that statement, to devise cunning works to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. Now, all of this workmanship was for the construction of the tabernacle that was used in the service of God and was the indwelling place in a special sense for God in the Old Testament. And uh, you'll notice also that these were manual works, and we might add mental works. In chapter 35, verse 34, uh, we find that he was also to teach other people. So he had a wide remit, a wide remit, uh, working in different ways. And as well as that, he had the necessary skills. Before he could teach, he would have to know how uh, to do those things himself. Such a wide variety of things. Uh, gold, silver, brass, stones, carving of timber. And he's making not only uh, or supervising the, not the manufacture, but the making of things for the tabernacle, but also included 
are the garments of the priests, the glorious garments of the high priest and the garments uh, for the priests who were under the high priest. Uh, So all of these required skills, and God gave him those skills. They came as a divine gift. You may remember that the children of Israel uh, weren't engaged in in all these exquisite types of works. Uh, They looked after their sheep. Uh, They were brick makers, uh, and uh, they were bricklayers. They weren't as involved in the intricate work that was required for the manufacture of the tabernacle. And then we notice something very especially about this. It's very important for you and me. These were what might be called secular works. I realize they were for a sacred purpose, but they were secular works. And uh, to do it rightly, this man, Bezaliel, needed to be filled with the Spirit of God. We might say, why? Surely if he had the skill and he knew how to work in what's called needlework in this, or not in this particular passage, but in this book, in needlework, in gold, silver, and so on, surely if he had the necessary skills, he could just go ahead and do it. But no, God says, I have filled him with the Spirit of God to do these things, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver, and so on. So why did he need to be filled with the Spirit of God? Well, one particular reason is the building was a sacred building. It was set apart for God's use. And at the end of this book, we find God coming in, in all his fullness, filling the tabernacle with his presence. And uh, those who were in it, they had to uh, go out in a sense for a short time because God was so powerfully and wonderfully present in the tabernacle. The Shekinah glory was there, and offerings were offered in the tabernacle that pointed forward to the supreme sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. You may remember two of the sons of Aaron went into the tabernacle on one occasion, and instead of obeying what God had commanded, they offered strange fire. A fire came from God that devoured them. Uh, They were consumed by that fire and their ashes had to be carried out of the tabernacle. They defied God. They did wrong. And as a result, they lost their lives. And we see how, how sacred the presence of God is, how solemn the presence of God is. And we see something similar in the erection of the building that replaced the tabernacle the building of the temple. Uh, When uh, David had gathered materials together, he wasn't allowed himself to construct the temple, but when he had gathered materials together uh, and at the end of his life, he spoke to the congregation of Israel. And he said, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. And he adds these words, for the palace, that's what he calls the temple, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. It's for Jehovah God. It's a very important place. The fact that what might be called secular work uh, uh, opens up uh, a whole new area of thought for Christians when we realize that secular work, work that is done with our hands or with our minds, is also sacred work for the Christian work that is to be dedicated to God. What do we read in the scriptures? Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Everything has to be done for him. You think of the work of the housewife that that many people look down on. What a valuable work that is that is done in the home, in the training of children. I realize it. Many women today have to go out to work uh, because of the pressures that rest upon the family. But the work of the housewife, and if the wife is working out in other spheres, then there's a duty on the husband to help out in the home. I say that to you, husbands, and uh, I hope that you're already doing it. You shouldn't need an exhortation from the pulpit. But the work of the housewife, it's to be done for God. It's sacred work. The work of the laborer. 
Uh, that is to be done for God. It's sacred work. Uh, wherever we look, whatever task we are required to perform, that is to be done for God. Work inside the house of God, work inside the home, work inside the workplace, that is all to be done for God. There's a very interesting passage in Ephesians chapter 5. And that passage is written to slaves. They're called servants in the translation, but the original word indicates slaves. Uh, slavery is a horrible thing. Uh, I spent 15 years in London, and uh, 75 to 80 percent of our congregation uh, was drawn uh, from the black community, from Africa, and from the Caribbean. People that we loved, people that I consider my very dearest friends, and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed being there amongst such people. Well, Paul writes to slaves, and I know that the hurt that was caused by slavery, I know still almost a hangover uh, that some people have because of the ill treatment of their forebears. But Paul's writing to slaves, and he says to them, servants or slaves, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. In singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Notice that. Here you come to what was in the ancient world the lowest stratum of society. Uh, many of them had no standing whatsoever. If a robbery took place and the master was robbed or someone was attacked and injured or even killed, the master of those slaves who owned the slaves, he had the right, he had the right to, to whip the slaves, to beat the slaves, even to put them to death. But he had the right to torture them to extract information. Do you know anything about what has taken place? Well, you might know nothing. You'll still be tortured. So that uh, if possible, he'll find out who is the responsible slave. If he doesn't find out and they're all innocent and some outside party has done it, it doesn't matter. They're just slaves. You can beat them to death. It's like smashing a chair or a piece of furniture. They have no rights. They're slaves. Yet what does Paul say to them? Be obedient to your masters. He says, with good will, with good will doing service. Now, I'm not saying that all the masters were cruel, but many of them were. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord. So it's sacred work for the slave the, the menial of society, uh, the lowest rank in society. It's sacred work what he does. It's secular work, but it's sacred work because it's to be done for the Lord. Now, when it's sacred work, there's not much room for doing that work in a slovenly fashion. There's not much room for laziness. Indeed, people talk about a holistic approach to health. You're not well. There are some who say, we look, need to look at the whole man. Uh, look at the mental side, the physical side, and indeed, in some cases, the spiritual side. Well, if that's the case with approach to health, realize that we need a holistic approach to life itself. Everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we think should be done for the Lord. After all, after all, he gave us life. And after all, if you're saved, the Lord Jesus Christ gave his life for you. Uh, he did everything that he did for the glory of God and for the benefit of his chosen people. Now, you might say, we know the preacher. Uh, he needs to be fully consecrated to the Lord. We know that uh, the Christian worker needs to be fully consecrated. We need the missionary to be consecrated fully to the Lord. But so does every single Christian. You and I, we need to be fully consecrated to the Lord. And that leads me to my second point. 
to do that task that is allotted to us, we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. In chapters 31 and 35, we read that God filled Bezaliel with the Holy Spirit, really emphasizing to us how very important that was. It's secular work, but I've shown to you it is also sacred work. Never think lightly of any part of your time, whether relaxing uh, or sleeping uh, or working. Never think lightly of any part of your time. All needs to be consecrated to the Lord. And in order to be consecrated, we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. It's interesting, you know, that in Ephesians 5 and verse 18, after Paul has said to the Christians, be filled with the Spirit, he deals with a whole range of things in our lives. He deals with our attitude. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves, he says, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Uh, and he says, giving thanks always to, to, for all things to God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And where does he go next? After speaking of our attitude, which should be a spiritual attitude, a grateful attitude to God, a humble attitude, for he mentions submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Where does he go next? Well, he goes into the home. He deals with the wife and the husband. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And all that is linked by a series of what are called participles. Now, some of you will know what I'm talking about uh, when you speak of participles. Others of you will be puzzled. Well, they are verbal nouns, and in this case, they're verbal nouns. And verbal nouns uh, do not stand on their own. Uh, they, they, need, they need a main verb on which they rest. And the main verb is be filled. It's one word in the Greek, be filled. Uh, be filled with what? Be filled with the Spirit. Uh, and then he goes on to, to give these ing words, these participles. Uh, and these participles, uh, they link uh, to that expression, be filled, or be filled with the Spirit. Uh, and so to have the right attitude, I need to be filled with the Spirit. For a wife to be a good wife and a godly wife, she needs to be filled with the Spirit. For the husband to be a loving husband, who's not a dictator, who's not a tyrant in his home, uh, who gives leadership in the home, he needs to be filled with the Spirit. And where does Paul go after that? Well, he goes into the family. He has spoken to the husband and wives. Now he deals with the children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Yes, children, you need to be filled with the Spirit of God in order to be good children, in order to be obedient children, in order to please your parents in the best possible way. And then it says, fathers, Fathers, uh, they are to instruct their children. They are to discipline their children. It's parents, really, we can include in that. Uh, and they're to do it uh, and set a good example before the children. They're not to say one thing and do another. So if I want to be a good father, if you want to be a good mother, you need the infilling of the Spirit. It, it's sacred work. Sacred work. Uh, and then he goes into the. Uh, employment place. Again, we have those expressions I've used about the servants, uh, that they are to be obedient to their masters with goodwill doing service, uh, not to do it simply when the eye of the master is upon them. They are to do that service. And then he deals with the masters themselves. They're not to be tyrants, uh, uh, being cruel and nasty to their servants. If they're Christian masters, he says, do the same things unto them, forbearing or moderating, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. It's really saying to employers, in the modern situation, employers and employees, you, if you're an employee, you're not working there for the money. You're working there for the Lord. And you're to do it to the very best of your God-given ability, seeking the infilling of the Spirit of God. You're a master, you're to treat your employees fairly, 
an employee, employer, I should have said, if you're an employer, you need to treat your employees fairly and, and, and give them a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Remembering, remembering that you have a master in heaven who knows all about you, who understands everything about you, and who will hold you to account. Who will hold you to account if you're cruel and vicious and nasty and selfish as an employer. So wherever we look, wherever we look with sacred work, uh, Paul goes on to speak uh, in Ephesians chapter 6 about warfare against the powers of darkness. How can I fight the devil without being filled with the Spirit of God? And then he comes to the, the, the last thought in that sequence, praying. And he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. If I'm going to pray aright, I need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So, so I will make this suggestion to you. In the morning, you're perhaps going to read a small section before you go out to work or go about the chores that are necessary to you. Pray for God to fill you with his Spirit. And during the day, keep asking him to fill you with his Spirit. And in the home, amongst your family, in times of recreation, when you come before the throne of grace, ask, ask for the infilling of the Spirit of God. You know, in the Bible, you get instances of people who were filled with the Holy Ghost. I'll start at the earliest possible age. I'll start with John the Baptist, because we're told that he was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. What a statement that is. Now, he's unique. He's saved before he is born. One of our ministers mentioned this recently, and uh, one of my family was there, and that person, I thought identify male or female, uh, spoke to me and didn't agree. And I agreed with the minister, and I hope I persuaded my, uh, my offspring that the minister was right. In the womb of his mother, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. He was clearly saved, and he leaped for joy in the presence of Jesus Christ, the unborn uh, Jesus Christ, if I may even express it that way, in the womb of Mary. Now, we're not saying that that's uh, something for every child, but when a child is saved and going forward, that child needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit and will only go forward, really, as being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I, I come to the very early stage of the spectrum, and then I move to the other end. The parents of John the Baptist were elderly, uh, they were past the age of childbearing, but miraculously God gave Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, a son. Well, when she was in the presence of Mary and she spoke out, pronouncing blessing upon Mary, she was filled with the Holy Ghost. There's a, a more elderly woman, we don't know her exact age, but she's filled with the Holy Ghost. And then there's Zacharias. He was dumb when he didn't believe uh, the angel's pronouncement when he doubted it. But then when they were naming the child, they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. Uh, and his, his mother, Elizabeth, said his name should be John. And they said to Zacharias, what is he to be called? And he asked for a writing slate and he wrote on it, his name is John. And immediately, immediately he was filled with the Holy Ghost and he spoke of the child, and he spoke of the one who was greater than the child, the Lord Jesus Christ. So you look at both ends of the spectrum, the early stage and the late stage, and you get people filled with the Holy Ghost. Of course, the apostles were filled with the Spirit of God, and greater than they, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was filled with the Spirit, filled to overflowing. The Bible says that God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. He was more filled with the Holy Ghost than any other person. I say to you this, how can we hope to succeed and please God without being filled with the Holy Spirit? How can we hope to succeed? You see, it's sacred work. 
that we are doing. If it's not done in the fullness of the Spirit, it's done in a measure of the flesh. And the flesh is corrupt. Might you imagine uh, doing something that is very beautiful and then putting in those uh, things into it uh, that absolutely jar with, with what you're seeking to do. Someone coming from the outside will look and they will say, but you've ruined it. You've ruined it. You've done such a good job. And why did you do that But there? In that way, you've ruined it. But what you do in the flesh, it, it, it mars the work of God. It mars your sacred work. You and I, if we profess to be saved, we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. And a very quick look now at the person filled with the Holy Spirit, Bezaliel. He was well qualified for the task. We read those verses in Exodus, and they speak of all the things that he had to do. Card work and engraving of stones, the stones for the shoulder that were placed on the shoulders of Aaron, bearing the children of Israel upon his shoulders, the engraved different stones, and then the stones that were placed in the breastplate showing him a type of Christ bearing the children of God on his heart. Again, those had to be engraved. Uh, the woodwork had to be done. The garments had to be uh, made. And uh, he had that task of, of showing them uh, how to do that. Everything had to be done in accordance with God's instructions. When Moses was given those instructions, we read that God said to man, Look, that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. You've got to do it exactly as I tell you, God says to Moses. And then he passed on those instructions to Bezaliel. So he had all these skills that were necessary given to him as he was filled with the Spirit of God. The point I want to make in this is that you and I have tasks to perform. Sometimes God asks us to do something that we think I, that we can't do. You say, I, I couldn't do that. Maybe you're asked to give a word of testimony. Or maybe you're asked to give a gospel tract to people, go round the doors. Say, I couldn't do that. I couldn't speak. If the Lord asks you to do something, he equips you. He gives you the skill. He gives you the strength. I never thought to be a minister of the gospel. I never thought to be one. But the Lord, the Lord called me into his service and he has helped me to preach his word in different places. And he has been gracious and merciful to me. The Lord equips you. Whatever task it is, however menial, however great, the Lord equips you. But he equips you by filling you, filling you with his word, which is the word of the Spirit, filling you with his Spirit, giving you a heart to do it, and giving you joy in his service. So here is a man also who was a good follower. Moses instructed Bezaliel, and when he was filled with the Spirit of God, he was a good follower. He wasn't a man who queried the instructions. He wasn't a difficult man to work with. When he was under instruction by another, he submitted to that instruction, and he followed out what God had taught to Moses to the very last detail, to the very last letter. He followed it. But also he was a good teacher. He was a leader as well as a follower. If you're a good follower, you will be a good leader. It says, The Lord said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezaliel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he hath filled him with the Spirit of God and wisdom, understanding, knowledge, all manner of workmanship, and to devise cunning works to work in gold, silver, brass, cutting of stones, uh, carving of wood. Uh, and it says, He hath put in his heart, that he may teach, that he may teach. He's a follower, but he's also a leader, uh, both he and Aholiab, uh, the son of Ahizamach of the tribe of Dan. So he's a good leader, a good follower. He's a good learner. He isn't one of these free spirits that you find. There's people who say, I don't belong to any church. I'm a free spirit. I, I just go as the spirit of God leads me. Usually, it's nothing to do with the Spirit of God. Usually it's, I want to do that. And so I'll do it. Uh, I'll not be under any discipline. 
I'll not be under any leadership. No, that's a wrong spirit. It leads to disaster and it leads to trouble. Uh, We need to be like this man, this man Bezaliel, filled with the Spirit of God. God provided him with the necessary skills. The work to him was sacred. Every detail, uh, every thread uh, that's threaded through uh, the the different garments uh, and uh, the different cloths and uh, every thread that's threaded through uh, the, the veil for the tabernacle and the curtains for the tabernacle. Every detail, every detail is done for God, done under God's instructions, done for the glory of God. And that's what we need to be like. Uh, and if we are, we will be exemplary workers. Nobody will have to find fault with us. Nobody will have to say, that was slipshod. Uh, that was a practice that was utterly wrong. You cut corners. You cut corners to make more money out of it. You do it, even if you lose money on it. You do it to the very best of your ability. Uh, no sharp practices. Uh, no cutting of corners. Do it exactly as it should be done under the influence of God's Spirit. And I believe if we do that, we'll have a clear conscience. We'll be far more content and we'll be far easier to work with. And what's more, we'll get the job done. And I want to finish very briefly with this statement. The blessing, the blessing of being filled with the Spirit of God. Notice what it says in the two verses of chapter 39, the last two verses. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel made all the work. And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord commanded. Even so had they done it. Notice how it's said twice there. They had done it as the Lord commanded. Even so had they done it. So the Lord is very pleased. He's very pleased with a work that is well done. And it was done as it should be done. And isn't that how Christ did his work? Isn't that how Christ did his work? He never failed in any detail. And on the cross, he cried out, it is finished. In the original language, it's one word. And it's in what we call the perfect tense. And the perfect tense indicates a work that is, fi- that is finished, but whose effects continue. The work is done, the effects continue. I'll illustrate it in a way that I always illustrate it. You go to the National Gallery in London and you go in and you look at a painting scene. Maybe Gainsborough or Constable or maybe some of the painters of the Reformation age. It may be a rural scene, it may be a city scene, it may be a scene beside a river. And you stand there and you drink in the beauty of the scene. You almost feel yourself to be there. You look at it, you imagine yourself in Venice or in Austria uh, or in uh, some other place. You imagine yourself out in the countryside in a more idyllic age and everything's calm and beautiful. You go into the city uh, and you see some of the magnificent buildings of the city and you're almost there. You're there in your mind. The painting may have been painted maybe three, four, five hundred years ago. But the effects continue because that painting has an effect on you. Christ said, it's finished. The work was done. The effects continue. That's why you're saved if you're a child of God. The effects continued. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us or keeps on cleansing us. From all sin, the effects continue. He did the work so perfectly that the effects continue and will continue to the end of time and will continue throughout eternity for we are preserved in Christ Jesus through the shedding of his blood on Calvary's cross. That's how it should have been done. That's how it was done. And that's how it's done when you're filled day by day and for every task with the Spirit of God. And notice the last four words, and Moses blessed them. 
He blessed them. He was happy. A greater than Moses will bless us. Jesus Christ will say, well done. Two of the sweetest words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. How sweet to hear that blessing coming from the lips of our Savior. So I say, seek then the infilling of the Spirit of God for every aspect of your life. And if you're not saved, I say, seek something that is basic but vital. Seek the Lord. Isaiah 55 and verse 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let's seek the Lord, one and all. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we pray that thy blessing will rest upon us. We thank you for Bezaliel. We thank you for choosing him, for setting him apart. And we thank you, Lord, for filling him with the Holy Ghost. And we bless thee, Lord, for all the blessings we receive when we are thine and when we are filled with thy spirit and when we do what we do for the honor and the glory of thy great and holy name. Apply thy truth to every heart, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we'll sing our final hymn. It's just one verse. I'd like to finish a morning service. Well, I know we're in the afternoon here, but I'd like to finish the morning service with 725. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The doxology, it will be familiar to you, and we'll stand as we sing. Lord, we ask thee to dismiss us in thy fear with thy love and blessing. Spread thy covering wings around us till all our wanderings cease and at our Father's loved abode thy saints arrive in peace. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>